Hello there everyone, this is ASP.NET without Windows. My name is Kevin Griffin. I am the owner of SwiftKick, a software training and consulting firm based out of Chesapeake, Virginia. I'm also a Microsoft MVP specializing in ASP.NET. Specifically, I've spent the past 10 years of my career focused on teaching developers how to be more productive in ASP.NET. And I'm hoping with this session, I'm able to do the same. I'm available through email or through Twitter if you have any questions after this course, as well as I maintain a blog at kevgriffin.com, and I'm also the author of the Twilio Blueprint. Now this course is divided into three different sections, but there's a common set of goals that will overlie each session as we go. And my primary goal is to teach you some of the new concepts in relation to .NET Core. Now, .NET Core is this brand spanking new thing, and a lot of the folks watching this material probably have not been introduced to it properly. Uh, I like to show you how to use .NET Core specifically in a non-Windows environment. All my demos are going to be done inside of Ubuntu, which is freely available and very easy to set up. Uh, those of you might be working on different flavors of Linux that are not Ubuntu, or you might be working on a Mac. Many of the concepts will translate very easily to those environments as well. If you run into any specific issues with your environment, uh, I would love to know about them and try to help you work through them. Along the way, I'm going to show you a lot of tricks because working in a non Windows environment really means you have to learn how to do everything differently than you would inside of Windows. As when we're in Windows, we use Visual Studio, and Visual Studio does 99.9% .9 of everything that we need. When we're outside of Windows, we don't have the crutch that, it's, that is Visual Studio to lean on. We have to learn how to do things differently. So I'm hoping along the way, I'm able to show you all this really cool stuff. So how is this course going to be broken out? Well, there's three parts. The first part is a simple history of .NET and ASP.NET development. I want to talk to you about where it all began and how web developers on the Microsoft stack have progressed over the past 15 years. It's really interesting and it's a good insight into where we are now and what are the next 5-10 years going to look like. That will lead us into a discussion of .NET Core and specifically the .NET standard. How is it that we can develop applications on .NET Core that are cross-platform, but when we were on the .NET framework, that was limiting us to only Windows? We'll dive into your environment. Uh, specifically, I'll show you how to set everything up inside of Ubuntu, uh, including a .NET Core installation. We'll show you a couple supporting tools, such as VS Code, and also Node.js for some of our later demos. And finally, we'll wrap up part one with a skeleton tour of an ASP.NET Core application. What does it look like opening a brand new application with ASP.NET Core? If you're a seasoned ASP.NET developer, there are a couple key changes that you have to be aware of because an ASP.NET Core application shares the name ASP.NET, but there are several parts that will look different to you. In part two, we're going to spend some time at the command line. And this part is focused on scaffolding out a new application. And there are multiple ways for us to do this. First is with the .NET command, and then second is with a code generation tool called Yeoman. I want to show you both approaches because there are pros and cons of using one approach over the other, depending on what type of app you want to scaffold and how quickly you want to get it done. And then lastly, we'll talk about sharing code between Visual Studio, someone running on Windows, and working within other editors. Because everything in .NET Core is cross-platform, we need to talk about the scenario of someone working on cross-platforms. Then finally, in part three, I want to talk about a couple of unique challenges. Uh, first is unit testing. Because we're doing everything at the command line, we don't have the ability to use test runners that would come with Visual Studio. So how do we do that? We'll talk about a couple deployment strategies, uh, specifically how do I deploy to something like Azure App Services? How do I deploy to Docker? That's a new upcoming technology. 
Or how do I deploy this to a Linux server all by itself uh, out there on the internet? We'll talk about these and a couple things you should be aware of. And then finally, we'll wrap up with a couple of my final thoughts and where you should go on from here. One thing I like to do before diving into the real technical aspects of ASP.NET Core is to take a walk down memory lane. How did we get to where we are now from the very beginning? So here is a very brief history of ASP.NET as we know it. Now this slide might seem a little out of date, but we have about 15 years of decisions made from the initial release of ASP.NET to the release of ASP.NET Core. If we go back all the way to 2002, this is the initial release of ASP.NET 1.0. And it's also very close to the initial release of the .NET framework. Before this time, web developers were not in the Microsoft stack really. We had classic ASP and that was great and it was getting the job done. You could develop in PHP or you could use other open source applications. Microsoft had a little bit of a dilemma. With the .NET world coming up and users, developers using WinForms to develop their applications or using something like MFC in the C++ realm or using Delphi, Microsoft needed to take all these developers and try to convert them into web developers. So how, how do you make that happen? Well, Microsoft decided, let's take the same ideas that developers are used to in WinForms, such as click and drag design, double clicking for events, wiring up event handlers. And let's take those ideas and move them over into the web. And this is where WebForms was developed. WebForms gave you the same designer view as you were used to with WinForms. You can just click and drag stuff over to, to a designer view and it would render the way that you would expect it. So this whole group of developers used to writing desktop applications can now move over into the web very seamlessly. And this was a great way to move a large number of devs into the web world. Let's fast forward to about 2009. Along this whole course, web developers on the Microsoft stack are developing ASP.NET applications, specifically with web forms. Click and drag here, wire up event handlers. The, the web was full of ASP.NET applications. But the problem was the web was moving in a slightly different direction. Applications in, say, Ruby on Rails, uh, were introducing new paradigms that was making the web a little bit more stateless. And it was introducing the way of building these more robust web applications that web forms just couldn't keep up with. So in 2009, the Microsoft group introduced ASP.NET MVC. Now MVC, if you haven't used it, stands for a model view controller. And it's a much more robust way of building web applications in today's architecture. Many applications today are still built on top of MVC. Now let's fast forward a little bit more until 2015. At this point, developers have been developing in either web forms or in MVC with web API. They've, they've been doing a great job. But the big, big problem that we've been running into is that many of the best tools out in the industry are not Windows centric. Whereas ASP.NET, you're kind of tied to Windows. This caused the ASP.NET to take a look at where they are. They didn't want to be a Windows-centric platform anymore. They wanted to be cross-platform. And in order to do that with 15 years of decisions before them, had to take a step back and go, this is really a file new type effort. We need to start from scratch. We need to take the ideas that we have learned over 15 years. We need to look at the ideas that other people in the industry are using, other platforms, other languages. And we need to pull all those together and turn the .NET framework into something that can move forward for another 15 years. And this is where .NET Core and ASP.NET Core came from. You might be asking myself, yourself 
You might be asking yourself, Kevin, what are really the problems with ASP.NET? I've been developing ASP.NET applications for years. I'm, I'm really good at it. I'm accustomed to it. What are the problems? Why do I need to worry about this core thing and moving forward? And it's not an exhaustive list. There's a couple real high level ones I want to touch on. Uh, the first is a large ramp up rate. ASP.NET, as much as I love it, it has this really hard dependency on Visual Studio. Uh, specifically, creating a application in Visual Studio requires the project templates to be installed, and it requires that Visual Studio be aware of ASP.NET applications. But there are so many decisions that you have to make going into a file new type process. This is the template selector for a brand new ASP.NET web application. Now notice all the options on the screen. First, I have to select my template type. I can start with an empty template that comes with nothing in it. I could choose web forms if that's how I want to go. Well, then I have an option of MVC or web API. Okay, well, maybe I want one, maybe I want both. All right. Next to that, there's single page applications. Well, I want to develop a single page application. I'm getting used to this Angular thing or to this React thing. That might be a direction I want to go. Uh, Azure API app. Ooh, what's that? I've never heard of that before. Maybe that's what I really want, but I don't know that's what I want yet. And then Azure mobile app and Azure mobile service is the same idea. That might be a way I want to go, but I just don't know if that's where I want to go yet. And then looking underneath that, add web forms, add MVC, add web API. All right, so let's imagine I'm starting with a web forms application. This is telling me I could potentially add MVC and web API to it as well. Well, maybe I'm starting on web forms and I don't know what web API is, but maybe web API is something that I'm going to need. I have no idea. Uh, unit tests. If, Visual Studio will add unit tests for you. The template will add unit tests. All right, maybe that's something I'm going to need as well. I just don't know. Authentication. All right, well, I know I'm going to need authentication, but do I need basic authentication? Do I need Windows authentication? Do I need to authenticate to Facebook or to Twitter or GitHub or some other mechanism? so many decisions that need to be made right now because I'm at the wizard. This is going to set up my entire application. If I make the wrong decision now, I might have to start all over again. And then finally, Azure. Do I want to host this in the cloud? Well, maybe. I don't know. I haven't gotten there yet. That's not the decision that I'm ready to make. The point goes to show that in this one template, there are at least a dozen decisions you have to make before you can even press OK, which means you have to know what you're doing before you press OK. If you've been doing this for 10 years, you know exactly what you want. I want to start with an ASP.NET MVC application. Let's pull in Web API, and I'm going to use no authentication. OK, and go. You also know that when I start, this application. If later I figure out oh, I need authentication, I can always go at it. We know the process for that. But imagine you're a student or someone at a hackathon and you're coming in and you're building out these new applications and you need to do so rapidly. This template is not conducive to a get up and going mentality. Whereas if you look at something like Node.js, Ruby on Rails, those are one command go type environments. You just start down the road of building your app. You don't have to make all these high level decisions right away. And you don't have to understand all the potential decisions you can make. Next on the list, I'd like to talk about the high cost of ownership for an ASP.NET application. Uh, specifically, not the ASP.NET app itself, but kind of where you host it. And this is becoming more of a non-issue as Microsoft Azure becomes more prevalent. Choosing to run ASP.NET typically means that you have to run a Windows server because you have this IIS requirements that you need to worry about. 
Windows servers have licensing costs. They have maintenance costs because you have to pay someone typically a lot of money to manage the updates on them, make sure that they're secure, they're behind the proper firewalls. You have to put all this time and effort in, into maintaining the environment where your application is going to run. And those costs add up over time. And then finally, ASP.NET applications include the entire kitchen sink. To run ASP.NET, you have to have the .NET framework installed. So if you're targeting .NET 4.5, you have to have the entire .NET framework version 4.5 installed on your machine. And when you go start your application, it needs to pull in everything it could possibly need to run that application. This is a view of the references for a brand new application out of the box. There's a lot of stuff in here, and it's potentially stuff you don't need or you will never use, but it's included in the package. It's in the kitchen sink. And finally, this is not really a tangible problem, but ASP.NET isn't cool. If you go out into the industry with students coming up, people going to hackathons uh, in the startup realm, and ask them what their technology stack is, they're not likely to say ASP.NET. It's very unpopular with new developers. And I think the reasons go back to what I mentioned earlier. The ramp up rate for starting a new ASP.NET application is fairly high, and you have to be very specialized going in, or you have to have someone next to you to explain what everything means. It's very daunting. Compare this to a developer coming into Node.js for the first time. The basic Node.js demo consists of create a file, type in console.log, hello world, and you're done. It just works. So how do we solve all these problems? Let me introduce ASP.NET Core, really .NET Core. And then .NET Core is promoted as a way to build lightweight modular applications that can run on Windows, Linux, and Mac. Now let's dive into that a little bit deeper. First, cross-platform. The goal is that if I build an application on top of .NET Core, and I'm building it on top of Windows, I can take that same application code and port it directly to Linux or into Mac without having to make any code changes. Just simply pull down the Git repository and compile. Everything works. .NET Core also standardizes the .NET library. And this is called the .NET standard, which we'll talk about more in a moment. And the basic idea behind the .NET standard is that if I develop an application against a library that targets the .NET standard, it will work across all the platforms that target the .NET standard, whether that's Windows, Linux, or Mac. And it also doesn't matter what languages I'm using. So if I'm writing in C-sharp, but someone's using F-sharp to pull in my code, it should just work across the board. .NET Core should be fast. The team has made amazing strides over the course of performance. If we look at the benchmarks for different platforms, languages, and environments, ASP.NET, .NET in general, don't even make the list. They are so far at the bottom that it's laughable. With .NET Core, we now see ASP.NET contendering for a top 10 position. Their goal is to be number one in a variety of different types of benchmarks. This is drastically different from the environment a couple years ago. .NET Core applications need to be lightweight. If I'm developing a simple module and I just have a couple of dependencies. That's all I need. I should reference those exactly the way I need them. And I don't want to pull the kitchen sink along with me. This means when you build an ASP.NET Core application, you're pulling in just the pieces that you need to get the job done. The kitchen sink is left at home and you just take what you need with you. .NET Core is going to support world-class languages such as C-sharp, F-sharp, Visual Basic if you're still doing that, and want to make sure that you have access to some of the best features in those languages, such as generics, link, asynchronous support, and more. And put the cherry on all this goodness, the .NET 
core library is completely open source. Meaning, if you're going through code and you don't understand how a particular method in the library is working, you can just go to GitHub and look it up. In the supplement to this video, I'll provide the links to GitHub where you can go look at the code yourself. And not just that, if you find a bug in the code and you want to submit a fix, it's as simple as setting up a pull request in GitHub. The team actively accepts pull requests for any issues that they find, and they're very open about what their current progress is and what their focus is on. I want to reiterate that ASP.NET Core applications are completely cross-platform. That means they can work on Windows, Linux, and Mac. Back in my startup days, I worked with a co-founder who was running on a Mac. And I was running on Windows. We were building an application on top of Node.js. And the thing that I loved the most about that partnership was I could write code and he could write code and each other's code could work no matter where our application was. All my work was on Windows, all his work was on Mac, and we were deploying to a Linux server. And we never ran into an issue of, well, that code can't work on Linux. It only works on Windows. Or that code only works on Mac. It doesn't work on Linux. Those issues just did not exist in the Node.js world. I look at ASP.NET development where we are now, and I wonder, what would it be like to just do all my ASP.NET development in a Linux or a Mac environment? And that's really the core of this course, is can you be an effective ASP.NET developer in an environment that's not Windows? So how is all this possible? Now before, I talked about a little idea called the .NET standard. Let's dive into that just a little deeper. The .NET framework is really robust. There's, there's a lot in it, and it has to be Windows specific. But in this day and age, being Windows specific is a huge anchor, not just from a cross-platform standpoint. You're not putting the .NET framework on Linux. You're not putting it on Mac. There's no cross-platform cross ability. But even in the Microsoft realm, you can't put the .NET framework on the Xbox. You can't put it on the HoloLens. You can't put it on the Windows phone or Windows tablets because it's too beefy, there's too much in it. And in a world where we're trying to get devices as small and as slim as possible, we can't afford for the majority of our resources to be taken up by a framework. The portable class libraries came out a couple of years ago to try to fix this problem on different devices. But many developers found portable class libraries to be non-intuitive, very difficult to use, and very difficult to support. So the .NET standard comes in with .NET Core. And this says that if you are targeting a platform that uses the .NET standard or a particular version of the .NET standard, we are creating a contract to say that certain methods will be available to you. So if you take your code to another platform that also uses the .NET standard, we can guarantee that your code's just gonna work. That means any .NET platform, .NET framework. So if you're supporting .NET 4.6.1, which uses the .NET standard, your code will work. If you take your app over into Linux using .NET Core, everything works. If you move to a mobile device, say with Xamarin, your code will just work. I graciously stole this chart from the Microsoft blogs. I have the link at the bottom of the page. And it shows the idea. No matter where your application is, if it's on Windows with WPF, Forms, ASP.NET, on .NET Core with Universal Windows Platform or ASP.NET Core, or in Xamarin, so you're targeting iOS, Mac, or Android, if you're building these applications on top of the .NET standard, your libraries can go from Windows to Mac to Linux to mobile with no code changes. This replaces portable class libraries. And to make things better, version 2.0 of the .NET standard promises the highest level of compatibility with older .NET frameworks. 
Imagine a scenario where you could take code you wrote in 2005, bring it over to Linux, build it, and it just works without any code changes at all. That's what the .NET standard is aiming to do. If you'd like to read more about the .NET standard, I have the link here on the slide. Head over to GitHub and give it a read. It's always kept up to date. It's the single best place for any information about .NET standard. Now enough theory, it's time to get into code and start doing some demos. But first things first, we have to get our environment ready to do .NET Core development. How do we get started? Let's go. First thing we want to do is before we can do any sort of ASP.NET development on a non-Windows environment, we have to actually install the .NET Core framework. And this VM I'm starting on, it's completely fresh. It has absolutely nothing on it except the bare essentials. And I need to go install .NET Core. Now, a little bit of guidance. If you need to install this on a different flavor of Linux, or maybe sometime after this video comes out, the instructions might change. For the latest reference, you're going to go to .NET. I know, that makes a lot of sense, right? So .NET is a shortcut to Microsoft's website for .NET Core. On this web page, we'll go download. We'll select .NET Core. And we're going to scroll down a bit. Now, this page might change uh, over time. But what you're really interested in is the step-by-step -step instructions for installing the Linux version of .NET Core. Now, if you're running on Mac OS X, we'll do a separate uh, video just for Mac. Or if you're running on a version of Linux that's not Ubuntu, uh, for example, you might be running on Fedora or um, Red Hat. If that's the case, you'll want to follow the instructions specifically for the flavor of Linux that you're using, because it is different. I'm going to select Ubuntu, and in particular, I'm running Ubuntu 16.10. So I'm going to scroll down to the instructions. And if you're not too familiar with Ubuntu, that's OK. Uh, what I have to do is tell AppGit, which is the package installer for Ubuntu, that I need to set up a new location that I can pull packages from. I have to authenticate to that package server. And then finally, I can install my, my package. The .NET team's done a really good job of giving you the exact commands that you have to type, or in this case, copy and paste. So I'm going to copy the first command, switch over to the terminal and paste it in. Make sure you're doing this as super user. That sets up the appropriate package server. Then I'm going to add a key so it can actually authenticate to the package server and make sure I'm pulling down the legitimate packages. And then finally, I need to do a sudo apt-get update. And what this is going to do is update all the packages on the system. So now, from the terminal, I can tell it sudo apt-get install .NET dash dev 101, which at the moment is the current version of the .NET Core runtime. I'll say yes. And depending on your internet connection, this might take a couple minutes to download and install. So we'll wait for this to go. Okay, everything's done. Let's test to see if our install was successful. Now we're going to go a lot more in depth into the commands that you can use with .NET Core. But to test to ensure that .NET Core is installed successfully, just type .NET dash dash version. And this will spit out the current version of the .NET Core runtime, uh, which is 1.0.1 in our case. And we should be good to go. .NET Core is installed.
A couple of the supporting tools that we're going to talk about in this course require that you have Node.js installed. And I know what you're probably thinking, Kevin, this is supposed to be a course on ASP.NET and really .NET Core development. Why are you telling us to install Node.js? The simple answer is that many of the best tools out there for performing simple functions uh, like code generators, uh, build tools, etc., they're already built on top of Node.js. And why reinvent the wheel that you have to keep supporting and iterating on when you can just use the same tools that the community is already perfecting? To get started with Node.js, we just have to start a command line. Uh, I'm going to drop a link in the bottom of the video that you can go to. Uh, but for Ubuntu, this process is pretty simple. Normally, when you're in a Ubuntu environment, your first inclination is to do a sudo apt-get install Node.js. And you could do that. But one of the problems with most of the package managers is that this Node.js, by default, will point to a much older version of Node.js. And that might not be what you want to get accomplished. So we're going to start with the first instruction that you can get from the Node.js documentation. And that's to curl curl the command that downloads the script that can automatically install Node.js version 7 for you automatically. And this process, depending on your internet connection, could take anywhere from a couple seconds to a couple of minutes. And when you're done, we'll see the instructions at the very bottom tell us Please do an app get install for Node.js. And we can double check to see that we have the proper version of Node installed by typing in Node-V. This will spit out the current version of Node.js. Uh, in my case, it's 7.7.4. Uh, depending on when you're watching this video, you could be running a newer version. Not a big deal. Most of the examples that we talk about in this course will translate correctly from one version of Node.js to another. One small issue that you might run into while running Node.js inside of Ubuntu is that there are commonly permission issues using global packages with NPM, the Node Package Manager. I'm going to provide a link at the bottom of the screen where you can go to NPM's documentation to solve any potential problems you might have. Uh, but I'm going to walk through one of the most common ones that I have seen using Ubuntu in production environments. And the problem, without going into too much detail, is later we're going to discuss doing an NPM install of a global package called Yeoman. And when we try to do this out of the box, it will start going down the pathway of working correctly. except. NPM is going to try to write to a directory that requires elevated privileges. And for a global package, that's that's kind of a no-no. We want to be able to use this anywhere we are without having to type sudo NPM every single time. Now notice the error above. I'm getting permission denied because it's trying to write to a node modules folder uh, that I don't have permission to. So how do I fix this? The first part of fixing this issue is creating a new directory for all these different packages to go. So I'm going to call it npm global. Then I have to tell npm to set my globals to the new directory. I need to export or update my path and then I need to reload my profile. Now assuming I did all that correctly, let's do our install again. And we have success. So let me scroll back up and we'll see that my global package installed correctly. Uh, Yeoman, which uh, is a build 
uh, code generation tool. It automatically goes through a couple checks to make sure everything works correctly. If you get all check marks, then your thumbs up, good to go. And once you've done that, every time we open our terminal in the future, we'll know that NPM is set up correctly. One of the major things that we miss by being inside Ubuntu is a top of its class text editor. And you might be wondering, I'm very used to Visual Studio. Where's that same experience inside of Linux or even on a Mac? And the answer is there's a lot of options out there for text editors, but there's nothing out there that really comes close to Visual Studio as far as a .NET developer might be concerned. For example, right now I'm sitting at the command prompt. If I create a directory and let's say I CD into it and touch new file called myfile.cs, what if I were to open that into a text editor like Nano? Well, Nano's fine. Uh, it's a text editor. I can start writing text and it figures out what I'm doing, but it's not the type of developer environment that we would expect from something that's really top of its class. Because look at what I'm missing. I don't have any sort of autocomplete or IntelliSense. There's nothing doing syntax highlighting, uh, letting me know the difference between language keywords or variable names or method names. That There's really no helping hand here. And not to say this isn't impossible, you just really have to know what you're doing. And you have to type everything out by hand. So this is no good. If you're a hardcore developer, you could use Vim. So let's open Vim up. But then you have to know all the Vim shortcuts, which means you can't just start typing. You have to press I and say, all right, public class. And that works as well. But still, you have to be already familiar with Vim in order to really get the experience out of it that you would expect. Now, if you're a developer who has spent a lot of time in Vim already, we do have an alternative for you. So I'll cover that here in a moment. But let's assume that you're not gonna work in Vim. Where can you fall? Is there something like Visual Studio that we can pull into Ubuntu? And the answer is, of course, there's Visual Studio Code. Now, Kevin, I use Visual Studio, but this doesn't look like Visual Studio. And you're absolutely right. Visual Studio Code is a slimmed down version of Visual Studio that can run cross-platform, meaning it can run on top of Windows, Linux, Mac, you name it. It's built in Node.js using the Electron shell, which means your Visual Studio environment for creating ASP.NET is really running JavaScript underneath the scenes. It's really cool how it all comes together. To download it, which is free by the way, you go to code.visualstudio.com. Depending on your environment, you'll get a different download screen for Windows versus Mac versus Linux. Because I'm on Ubuntu, I want to download the Debian install. So I'll click download. And give it a moment. I'll tell Firefox to go ahead and open it with the default installer. When that loads up, I can say install and just wait a couple minutes. You might have to elevate your privileges. And awesome, everything's ready to go. So if we close this and also close Firefox, let's come back to our command prompt. Now remember, I just have this one file in here, myfile.cs. Let me open this with Visual Studio Code. Now after you've done the install, you now have a new command available to you called code. And if I say code dot, it will open the current directory in Visual Studio Code. So I can work in the context of any file or folder inside of this directory. I can also open individual files and that works as well. 
the first time you open Visual Studio Code, it'll give you some getting started information uh, so you can walk through and see what Visual Studio can do on your behalf. You'll also be interested in possibly installing extensions. Now, why are extensions important? Well, just typing in the editor will give you a little bit of intelligence that's built in. Notice that Visual Studio Code knows that class is a part of C Sharp. I can get more information on it, but I can just auto-complete it and can fill in the blank. These are just simple macros that are injected on your behalf. What's really nice is I'm getting this built-in IntelliSense uh, syntax highlighting. It's telling me what I need to know. Now, just as a current file, I'm not getting the full support of the underlying engine that runs inside of Visual Studio Code. For that, I have to install some extensions. So here's one called uh, C Sharp, which I already have installed, but you'll have to install separately. Uh, this runs a plugin called OmniSharp, and OmniSharp can compile your program in the background and provide you with real-time IntelliSense as you're typing. This is similar to the engine that runs inside of Visual Studio, so as you type, you get real-time IntelliSense. I have an additional extension installed here called MonoDebug, which is useful for doing uh, some debugging work that we'll see a little bit later in this series. I've opened up a sample project here to give you a little bit better understanding of how OmniSharp will work in your favor. I'm going to open Program CS and I'm going to add a couple new lines. Notice I'm getting syntax highlighting throughout the file. So I know string is the type, I know args is a variable, I can see use kestrel is a method call. I have all this really useful information. But now, as I start typing something like console, if I was using just a traditional text editor, console dot wouldn't really provide me with much useful information because a text editor doesn't know what methods or properties are available inside of the console object. But OmniSharp does know because OmniSharp is running through this code and it knows what's available at runtime inside of console. So I get this great list of all the methods and properties available to me, just like I would inside of Visual Studio. So I can say right line. As, as I start my parentheses, right line will tell me the various method signatures available. I can use a Boolean. I can use a char. I can use a char array, a char array and index and account, uh, so on and so on every possible iteration of console.writeline is available to me as IntelliSense. I'll say hello world and everything works. And also notice up here at the very top that I have squigglies under different lines inside my application. If I highlight over them, Visual Studio Code is telling me I have an unnecessary using directive inside my file. Well, of course, I'm not using anything inside a system.threading.tasks or system.link. And just like Visual Studio, I have helpers that will automatically perform the cleanup on my behalf. Now, awesome. It goes away and I don't have that need anymore. Throughout this course, we're going to use Visual Studio extensively. Every time we come in to edit a project, we're going to be inside of Visual Studio Code. If you'd like to follow along and you don't want to use Visual Studio, maybe you're already comfortable with a different text editor, you do have a couple options available to you. As I had mentioned before, the OmniSharp plugin is what powers Visual Studio Code. It knows how to run .NET Code, written in C-sharp or any other .NET language and provide your editor with the information it needs to give you a great experience. Now everything we showed is in Visual Studio Code, but you're not limited to just Visual Studio Code. Some of the other editors are available to you, such as Atom by GitHub, uh, Sublime Text, or Vim. If you use any of these editors, you can install OmniSharp underneath the scenes so it can power 
your editor of choice. You don't have to move the Visual Studio Code if you're already comfortable with any of these other editors. Before we dive into talking about the nuts and bolts of an ASP and a core application, it's useful for us to take a little bit of time and walk through this simple skeleton of a new app. In the next section, we're going to talk about how you create these basic scaffolds. But for now, I've already taken care of this part for us. On the left sidebar, we'll see all the files that are currently underneath this directory structure. And there's not very much here. If we start at the very top of the directory listing, we have a VS Code folder that's specific for VS Code. We can disregard it. It has information in there about how to build and how to launch this particular application. Underneath that, we have the bin and object folders. If you've used .NET, any time in your career, you already know what these folders are for. They're artifacts of having built an application with .NET. Then we have the www root folder. And this folder is used to host any static files that you want to deliver directly to a client that's requesting. For example, in future videos, We'll put in JavaScript, we'll add CSS, uh, images, maybe if we want to have static HTML, all that can go inside of www.root and it'll be served directly to any client that asks. Treat this as a public folder. Anything that you put into it can be publicly accessible from the internet. We have program CS, which we're used to seeing primarily with console applications. We have Startup CS, which was introduced to ASP.NET a couple of iterations ago, but it's really the backbone for making this entire application work. And then we have a CS proj file. And in older versions of ASP.NET Core, this file used to be package.json. But with the new updates to ASP.NET Core, we're back to CS proj files for all .NET Core applications. Now, first, if I open the skeleton CS proj file, this is the project structure for my application. It's much more condensed than CS proj files of the past. There's not very much in here. So for example, let's imagine I want to add a package reference to this application. It's just a matter of adding a new line. By adding the new package reference, I then can go out to the terminal and running a .NET Restore. So anytime you need to add new packages, all you have to do is update your CS proj file. Now let's take a look at program CS. And if you've ever started a new console application in Visual Studio before, you know this file very well. Program main. This is the entry point into our application. All the work starts here. And what's interesting is that this is an ASP.NET application. And typically in ASP.NET applications, we don't see the program main. The entry point into an ASP.NET application is handled by the ASP.NET pipeline while it's running underneath IIS. So it's interesting to see here that when my program starts, everything is loaded dynamically. The first thing we do is we create a new web host builder. The web host builder class is designed to help you to help you scaffold up a mechanism that can host a web application. And this web host builder has a couple of different extension methods on top of it. Uh, the first one is Kestrel. Now Kestrel is an open source web server built for ASP.NET. Think of this as the IIS of the open source world. 
It is capable of taking requests coming in from the internet or from the network, passing it into the ASP.NET stack and returning a response properly. The next line is use content root. Uh, this just tells the application where we're expecting all of our files to exist. That's going to be our current directory. On the third line, we're telling our web host that if we have IS installed, we should take advantage of IS integration. On Linux, it's really not an issue because we don't have IS. But if I were to take the same code and port it over to Windows, I might want to take advantage of IS. The fourth line is the startup file. Startup in terms of ASP.NET Core is where your application begins. This is how we set up all the dependencies our application is going to have. It's how we tell ASP.NET how to handle requests coming into the server. And it's how we tell ASP.NET how to handle things like errors or how to package a response to go out to a client. Finally, we bundle all that together and we run it. So by the time line 20 run actually executes, this is hosting on an open port. Let's dive in a little closer to the startup CS file. And this is where the real magic happens. The startup class is defined by ASP.NET Core and has two primary functions that will execute one right after the other. The first major method is configure services. This enables ASP.NET Core's dependency injection engine. Dependency injection is critical to the operation of ASP.NET applications. And in the past, you probably have used some sort of dependency injection framework, whether it was Inject or Structure Map or Castle Windsor, Autofact, Unity, you name it. We all have a favorite dependency injection framework. With ASP.NET, you can kind of put those all to the side because it comes with its own built-in injection framework. And based off the basic benchmarks I've performed in the past, it tends to be much faster than these other libraries already out there on the market. I tend to use just the ASP.NET injections in all my applications. But we'll talk more about that here in a moment. The second method is the configure method. And this sets up the application pipeline for a request coming into our application. Now let's imagine someone makes a request to a URL that's hosted by our web app. When that request comes in, it's going to enter the application pipeline. And the first thing we're going to do is log that particular request out to the console so we can see what's happening. Then we're going to check our development environment. If we're currently running in development versus production, I want to tell ASP.NET that given an exception or some sort of weird error, I should use a developer-friendly exception page. In older ASP.NET applications, we commonly refer to this as the yellow screen of death because it would give us all the information that we need about a crash in the app. In ASP.NET Core, it's not yellow, it's white, it has a big frowny face but it gets the job done the same way. It tells you what went wrong. And then the third part is this run command that tells ASP.NET that given any request, simply write back a response, hello world. If we go back to the terminal and we run this application by saying .NET run, the application will build if it hasn't been built before, and then it will start running. And this is telling us that the application is currently listening on port 5000. And if I open it in a browser, ASP.NET Core spits out Hello World. And back in my terminal, we see the commands coming in through the logging framework. So the first command is to the root, that return a 200 OK. I also got requests for the fav icon. Those return 200s because every single response is returning a 200. It doesn't matter if my URL is foo bar hello. It's always going to return hello world. And that's simply because in my application code, 
I'm telling it for every single request, just write back hello world. A couple key things that you might notice. This is ASP.NET, but it's not ASP.NET Web Forms. It's not ASP.NET Web API. It's not ASP.NET MVC. It's just a thing that takes in requests and spits back responses. There's no framework magic happening here. What would it take to add MVC to this particular application? Well, I already added the MVC dependencies to our CS proj file. And since I've done the .NET Restore, I know those assemblies are ready to go. Now back over in startup, I need to tell ASP.NET to prepare all the injections necessary for MVC applications. And MVC adds a simple method for doing that. On the service collection object, I want to tell it to add MVC. So any dependencies that build the MVC framework are now supported by the pipeline. So then down in configure, I can tell my app to use MVC. And just in two lines of code, I have injected ASP.NET MVC support into my app. Now for fun, let's comment out the run command and make sure everything goes through the MVC pipeline. How do we make this simple app into an MVC app? Well, step one, I'll need to create a controllers folder. Step two, I'll have to add a controller. And I notice my controller here doesn't have any code, so I'll scaffold it out real fast. Now I'll stop here for a second and I'll show you a couple little things that VS Code will do on your behalf. Notice I have red squigglies under controller, under I action, result, and under view. That's because VS Code doesn't know what these objects are. But if I put my mouse over it, we'll see I have a light bulb telling me I can set up a using statement for ASP.NET Core.NVC, which is where that file exists or I can use the fully qualified class name. But it's much easier for me to put in a using statement. Now all my squigglies are gone. The last thing I need to do on this is set up the route definition. And a couple small changes that you might not be used to from older ASP.NET MVC apps. Uh, the first is this I action result. Normally in MVC apps, we return some sort of action result, whether it's a view result or a raw result or a file result. All actions in ASP.NET Core MVC return I action result. Uh, so it's the same concept as before, just the class names in the interfaces have changed a little. Then the action itself is decorated with the route and the HTTP get attributes. Uh, this isn't particularly new. It's been around in MVC for a couple of iterations, but that's simply telling MVC that given a default route, which means no route at all, forward everything to this index action. And that's only for HTTP GET requests. And when all is said and done, return a view. That hasn't changed, it's all the same. Now I have to go create a view. So step one for that is create the views folder. Then inside the views folder, I'll create a home folder inside of that, I'll create an index.cshtml file. 
Now CS HTML, that hasn't changed at all. That's still razor syntax. I'll scaffold this out and put a little bit of filler code in it. And there we go. At the very top of the page, I'll add just simple razor telling it no layout page. And that should be all I need to do. Well, let's go back out to our command line. Let's close it down, clear our page, and we'll say .NET run again. All right, new applications running. Let's hit logo host. And there I have it. Hello world. This is rendering inside of my view. And it also means that all my requests are going through the ASP.NET Core MVC pipeline. It's not going through just a raw response handler. So there you have it. That is a very basic ASP.NET Core application. We started with a very simple skeleton didn't do much, would take a request in, spit back a response. It was the same response no matter what. But then we took it and added ASP.NET MVC functionality, a very simple controller with a very simple view. And we can build on this a little bit more in the future. In the upcoming sections, we'll show you some more command line so you can start with a better template. We'll walk through the process of building these applications out just a tad more. And then we'll also show you how you can take this application, put it up in the GitHub, and pull it down on a Windows machine and use it on multiple platforms without having to make any major code changes at all.